Thank you so much, Roger, for this uh, nice introduction and Reggie and David for organizing this conference. So let me, uh, hold on, let me share my PowerPoint. Um, okay, so can you, can you see me? Yes, I mean, yeah. can yep. you see? Well, now, see there you are. Yeah, is it working? We can see it. Okay. Okay. So uh, this uh, presentation today is a part of my broader book project, tentatively titled Aesthetic Capitalism, which I will discuss in a minute. Uh, but this is a very new project and it's a very, very early stage. So I will, I would appreciate your insights, ideas, critique, anything. So uh, let me start with this quote, use not perfumery to flavor soup. This is a quote from Aristotle, who warned against mixing perfume with soup because he argued perfume would not nourish flavor of soup. And in ancient Greek, it was actually a common practice to add perfume to dishes to intensify their flavor. But Aristotle argued that two distinct kinds of sensations combined, in this, in this case, the smell of perfume and the taste of soup would deforce our sense of pleasure by habituating us to them. So if mixing two sensations was disagreeable to the ancient Greek philosopher, the practice of mixing two or more sensations became an important and common practice for modern business to mobilize the senses in marketing. For example, consumer goods companies combined multiple sensory stimuli to complement each sense and intensify consumer sensations from at least the late 19th century, creating a dizzying array of products ranging from cosmetics and toiletries to food and fashion. And this was the beginning of what the historian of science Stephen Shapin has called the aesthetic industrial complex. And my, in my previous work, which Roger kindly introduced, I examined this creation of the new business of the senses by focusing on the color of food and visual appeal in the food business. So expanding my former study and building on shaping concept, I argue that business attention to the senses created what I call aesthetic capitalism. And I use the term aesthetics to refer to holistic human perception and sensation, rather than simply the domain of art, beauty, or visual elements. Following the original definition derived from the ancient Greek word, aesthesis, and the concept developed by German philosopher Alexander Gottlieb Baumgarten in the mid 18th century. So I'm using this word aesthetics and later aesthetic judgment in a different sense than Kantian aesthetics. And in this presentation and my broader project, I examine how integrating aesthetics into business strategies became an important part of capitalist development from at least the late 19th century, particularly with the emergence of mass production and mass consumption. And scholars and theorists have already pointed to the importance of aesthetics in capitalist society. For example, Karl Marcus, who was one of the greatest aestheticians of the modern period, according to the literary theorist, Terry Eagleton, criticized devastating change in people's sensory experience in capitalist society. And later in his 1971 Marxist study, Critique of Commodity Aesthetics, the German philosopher Wolfgang Fritz Haug saw the technological and economic system of creating a new sensory environment as the technocracy of sensuality, which he argued controlled and dominated over people and nature. So I situate my project in this broader scholarly discussion on aesthetics and capitalism, although I don't necessarily agree with all of their arguments, and examine how and by whom Aesthetic, capitalism was, aesthetic capitalism was created, and what were the implications and how it changed over time. And this importance of the sense of, of business has generated scholarly attention also among marketing scholars. And over the last decade, management scholars, mainly at business schools, have identified the surging interest in what they call sensory marketing among marketers in many different businesses. 
And these are some of the examples published by marketing scholars concerning sensory marketing. And according to one of the pioneers in this field, Aradhana Krishna, the decades between the 1940s and 60s was what she calls the no-nonsense era, where most business ignored sensory aspects of products. And the following 1970s was the era when the brand name became more important than other aspects of products. And they argue that only in the 2000s, finally marketers started paying attention to the sensors. And these scholars also argue that appealing to the senses was a means to elicit deeper, more personal experience for consumers with their products, brands, and services. However, if we look at sensory marketing from a longer and broader perspective than what marketing scholars have conceived, this marketing strategy appears to offer a different view. And I use the term sensory marketing as a business strategy to appeal to consumer senses by investigating, creating, and promoting sensory aspects of product, which encompasses not merely the advertisement and selling of goods, but also product research and design. And based on this definition, I argue that first, historical evidence suggests that sensory marketing is not a recent phenomenon, but also a long history, at least over a century since the 19th century. And also secondary and more importantly, at the birth of sensory marketing, its objective was not necessarily the creation of personalized experience, but the depersonalization of consumer experience. So for this presentation, as a way of understanding part of the rise of aesthetic capitalism, I will briefly explain how sensory marketing broadly conceived helped to depersonalize consumer experience by focusing on so-called sensory science. So what is sensory science? And my fellow presenter, Ingama, will talk about sensory science uh, much more in detail later for his presentation. But this uh, here is a, a relatively widely accepted definition of sensory science. So in a nutshell, it is scientific research on sensory aspects of products, including food, as well as other consumer products, such as uh, cosmetics. And this was, uh, in a way, the aesthetic judgment of products by identifying the right or marketable color, texture, flavor, and taste, which consumers would accept. So through scientific knowledge and technology, scientists to try to develop a standardized and systematic way of understanding sensory qualities of products. And by doing so, I argue that sensory science and also scientists help to depersonalize consumer experience through standardization, acontextualization, and the de-skilling of consumers. So let me explain one by one just quickly. So first, standardization. A primary objective of sensory science was and has been to produce objective knowledge about something seemingly personal and intangible, which is the senses, and provide consistent or standardized and predictable sensory experience with virtually any consumers, or more precisely, anonymous, depersonalized, or what business people have conceived as average consumers rather than cater to each consumer's personal sensory satisfaction. And secondly, what I call acontextualization was another element. So research on the senses or sensory research was usually conducted in a laboratory where the environment was strictly standardized and controlled, such as temperature, humidity, lighting, and noise which was entirely different from the setting that people actually consume the product. But recent studies have shown, and probably we know from our own experience, that a context actually matters in the consumption of products, such as eating food. And also, sensory experience became increasingly detached from their temporal and spatial contexts. So take an example of the smell of the so-called fresh air used for room fragrances, or the sound of ocean waves used for heating music, or a theme park such as the Disney World or Sea World. These products and places offer people simulated sensory experience. 
So you can listen to the sound of oceans without actually going to the beach. And lastly, the de-skilling of consumers, which were enabled by standardization and acontextualization, facilitated also depersonalized experience. And I use the term de-skilling to mean that consumers no longer needed special skill or knowledge or ingredients. For example, cake mixers. So consumers did not need any ingredients but egg and water. The taste, flavor, and look of the cake was supposedly and ideally the same with whoever made it. So no failure, but no personal taste. But in a way, cake mixes and many other so-called convenient products might have helped to democratize sensory experience. But these goods also standardized and depersonalized not only what consumers purchased, but also what they created. So democratization and depersonalization went hand in hand in the era of mass consumption. So should we not use perfumery to flavor soup? Now, I want to conclude my presentation with some of the implications concerning this question. Uh, one minute, I. Okay. Making multiple sensations like perfume and soup and many other techniques has created unprecedented variations of sensory stimuli. But at the same time, business innovation and strategies tamed people's aesthetic sensibility by standardizing a contextualizing and de-skilling the entire experience of buying and using goods. Consequently, sensory science has helped to refashion the concept of aesthetics, which became not only an industry standard in product design and marketing, but also a social norm by altering people's cognition of their surrounding world. So now lastly, What's the point of asking this kind of question about perfume and soup? And what's the point of analyzing all of these? And I think by unveiling various dis uh, different kinds of consequences and implications, and also by exploring technology and the economy in relation to politics, culture, and ethics, for example, a history of capitalism and the senses, which we are discussing over the next two days, may be able to bring sensory experience back to the personal. Thank you.